Hi, my name is Yaniv Segal, and I'm the cover conductor this week with the Detroit Symphony. And we've got a great and exciting program for you tonight, and a special treat for this pre-concert chat, where we have two composers on stage. Well, three if I count myself, but I don't have any of my music being played today. Uh, but we're hearing two world premieres. And so we thought that this would be a fun time to chat with Roshan Etazadi and Chris Cerrone. Uh, and so the bulk of our chat today will be about their music, their process, about whatever seems to come up. So maybe I'll just spend a very brief time talking about that other piece on the program. Uh, you might have heard of this guy, Tchaikovsky. Uh, he's no longer living, as far as I know. Uh, so the Sixth Symphony is the second half of the program. It is one of the absolute towering masterpieces in symphonic literature. It's the last work that he completed, and uh, it's very dramatic. It uh, has a lot of things written about it, the pathos in it, the angst of Tchaikovsky going through life uh, with a lot of inner turmoil, uh, it comes out much later, and we know now that he was gay at a time where that was not really possible uh, to be accepted. So a lot of people look at this symphony and say this is in the midst of his depression, and uh, you can hear that in the music. Uh, there's a couple really interesting things to think about in this case. One is that just about the year before, or maybe a year before that, he finished The Nutcracker, which is quite the opposite of the pathétique. <laughs> And we don't look at that and say, well, there's a guy who's really depressed. <laughs> so, yes, of course, uh, you know, your, your psyche plays a role in, in, in whatever piece you're working on, and it's a snapshot of where you are as an artist and where you are in time. But you, you want to frame this in, in context. And he was clearly going for a dark feeling, and whether that was purely driven from where he was or some other context, I'll leave that for you to decide. Um, and then just the other thing, which is a, a practical matter, uh, this is the first symphony, or the first major symphony, I should say, in the Romantic era to end with the slow movement. And a great, great dark slow movement it is. Okay, he's not the first one. You know, Haydn did it. Uh, other composers have done things like this. So, you know, he, he's not the only one. But um, that third movement goes out with a really big bang. And these days, you know, you're gonna like jump up and start applauding and then you're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that, you know, <laughs> heaven forbid. Uh, but he really was going for that. You know, the, if, the, if you think about the way he ends some of the first movements of his concertos, the, the etiquette of, of audiences applauding between movements was absolutely the norm. Uh, the, another famous example would be Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, the second movement, which got so much applause that the, audience, that the orchestra had to play it again before they went on. And can you imagine us doing that today? That'd be like, oh, so you can't do that. So anyway, feel free to applaud after the third movement if you feel so <laughs> roused by the really exciting movement uh, in the orchestra. Even we know it, and yet we, we really want to give it that um, that applause. Uh, Peter Unjun is conducting. He he will wait for you. So 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 feel free. Um, so we have that out of the way. Uh, as you know. Um, this was originally a Leonard Slatkin conducting week. The next three weeks were to be his final as the, as the music director of, of the DSO. Um, and he had to undergo a uh, heart bypass surgery a few weeks ago. And he's recovering quite well and will be is ahead of schedule and as, as feeling as good as possible. And we are really grateful to know that and to have him back on the podium here next season. So, uh, th great thanks also to Peter Unjun for jumping in at the last movement, m last minute, with two world premieres and, of course, this big symphony. So, let me go in program order, perhaps, with Roshan, who opens up our concert. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're, maybe where you're from, what instrument you may have played, how you got into composition, and then we'll talk about your music. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Well, let's see, my name is Roshan Edizadi, and um, this is kind of my hometown band in a way. I live in Ann Arbor, that right now. I have lived there for the past four years. I teach at the University of Michigan. Um, but prior to that, I've kind of been an academic nomad and bouncing around various uh, higher education institutions. <laughs> uh, but I grew up outside of Philadelphia, and when I was a kid, 
I was pretty sure that I was going to go to college and be a flute player. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, and then uh, my flute teacher at the time said, well, if you're serious about this, what you really need to be doing is you need to be studying theory and you need to learn how to, um, you need to learn some of the mechanics of how music works. And I also had some piano background as well, but even today, my piano uh, background is, I, I call it functional, but not artistic. I mean, I can fake my way around show tunes and Christmas songs, <laughs> um, but functional, but not artistic. But I thought um, that I would start studying some theory. And then, shortening a long story, one thing led to another. I started writing music as extensions of these theory assignments. And then one summer, when um, when I was about 17, I applied to a summer program, and I submitted an audition tape, both as a flute player, and I thought, what the heck, I might as well send some scores as well. And I got accepted to that program as a composer and not as a flute player, and as it turns out, I'm really bad at practicing. <laughs> and um, who knew? Uh, but I, uh, I really enjoy making things up. And so um, that was kind of the beginning of the end of my flute playing career. And uh, I began playing less and less and less frequently and writing more and more and more. And now, here I am. So that's how, uh, that's how we ended up here. <laughs> Great. And your piece opens the program. And there's a special story about this commission. About this particular commission? Yeah. But so, um, in, uh, in celebration of Maestro Slatkin's final season here at the DSO, uh, rather than going back and commissioning some of the many, many composers with whom he's had long and established relationships, um, like John Corigliano and I think Cindy McTee and I think... Um, uh, uh, Stephen Stuckey. Stephen Stuckey, right, yeah. and, uh, and William Bolcom. Rather than going back and commissioning these composers, he commissioned composers who were connected to them in some way or students of them in some way. And I am here because when I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan at the turn of the century a few years ago, um, I was a student of William, William Bolcom, and I would be remiss, I know he's not here, um, but I would be remiss if I did not mention that tonight is his 80th birthday. So, <laughs> so I'm thrilled to be here um, kind of as a representative of his incredible teaching legacy on his 80th birthday. Great, thank you. So we'll, I'm gonna come back to you and ask you about this piece later, but let's, let's also introduce Chris, who's here, and, and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, the uh, 10 o'clock show is totally different than the 8 o'clock show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we work a little blue at the 10 o'clock show. <laughs> um, so my name is uh, Chris Cerrone. I'm a composer, obviously. Um, I'm a native of Long Island. I'm not a Michigander. Um, uh, and I studied um, composition initially in New York at the Manhattan School and later at Yale, where Roshan also studied. It's a very special place with really amazing composition teachers there. And, um, and I've been living in New York ever since. Although I do seem to have a special relationship with the city of Detroit, I realized um, in addition to these concerts, um, New Music Detroit, which is run by Eric Ronmark, the general director of the symphony, played my piece at the DIA last night, and I realized it's my fifth piece ever performed at the DIA, so I've had a really lucky opportunity to spend quite a bit of time in Detroit and working here, and it's a city with a really rich musical tradition, but you know, this is my first chance of working with the DSO, which is a really incredible, rare thing. Uh, I, was, I never had any promise as a performer, unlike Roshan, so there was no <laughs> chance of me becoming a performer. I was a pianist, but um, you know, a, a pretty, uh, not, not a great one. Uh, <laughs> um, but like Roshan, and I think like most composers, I found a great way to avoid practicing the piano <laughs> was to compose little things. And I could show my teacher, and she'd be like, oh, that's sort of like doing music, so you can do this. And so little by little, and, um, you know, I, I'm actually my background is sort of in classical, but also in, I played jazz in high school, and I played in rock bands, and uh, there's like a, a, a Sam is Dat tape of my grunge band from middle school uh, floating around somewhere. But um, at some point in the middle of all that, I became obsessed with the orchestra and writing for classical instruments and writing sort of thinking a lot about writing music over long periods of time. And that's a sort of, I got obsessed with classical music because it's the one sort of medium wherein you could compose something and you know, curate every note and it could last half an hour. Um, and it became, you know, so I became obsessed with that and that's when I decided to become a composer. Okay, now I might put you on the spot. So you have this long arc in your music 
mm -hmm. and yet you have a violin concerto that isn't actually that long. <laughs> and it's in one movement, kind it's, of. Well, it's, it's, in one, it's in seven seamless movements. Exactly. That last about 17 minutes. Exactly. So would you consider this a long, term, long piece? Or? I think it is the longest piece I've written for orchestra at this point. I've also written um, an opera, which is a little over an hour, um, and a bunch of other chamber pieces that are longer. But I think this is the longest orchestra piece I've written. So uh, the soloist tonight is the wonderful Jennifer Coe. And how did you come to get to write for Jenny? Uh, Jenny, uh, we met through a mutual friend who, uh, and supporter who brought Jenny to a concert of mine and she heard one of my pieces and I had seen her play, God, I can't remember the first time I'd seen her play, but I remember thinking she was amazing and so sort of he brought, me, brought her to this concert. I was very nervous and she was very gracious and probably a month later called me and said, you know, I'm doing this commissioning project and it happened to be for a sort of present for that patron. And she said, would you write a little piece for this? And I said, absolutely. So I sent her that piece. And you know, she sort of, a couple months after that, she's like, you know, I really like this piece you wrote me. Will you write me a concerto? And I was like, absolutely. Because <laughs> she's sort of, um, she's, my perfect, she's my favorite kind of performer in that she is totally at home in classical and contemporary rap. You know, you, she can play the most complicated modernist score, or she can play Tchaikovsky violin concerto, and it's, Amazing, so she brings that, both of those sensibilities to her performances. Okay, so let me go back to Roshan. Um, why, why don't you tell us a little bit, just a little sneak peek at this music of yours, if that's okay. Um, and then maybe can we go into the process of coming up with the notes that appear on the page? Right, okay, well the piece Diamond Rain is about the meteorological fact that on Neptune, the atmosphere is pressurized uh, to such an extent, and the chemical makeup is such that it actually rains particles of diamonds on the planet. And I thought that this was this amazing, otherworldly, beautiful mental image. Uh, and so, as coming up with the, so I had this like abstraction of an idea of an image, and then to come up with actual notes um, was kind of a whole different story. So I. Um, Thought, uh, I thought gesturally, I was thinking in terms of color. Um, and I also knew that in terms of structure, I wanted to have a lot of, um, I wanted to have juxtaposing sections that would sort of be um, relatable, but also off-putting in a way that things might be a little bit beautiful, but also a little bit alien, kind of otherworldly. Um, I started out, uh, with I don't know how specific uh, I don't know how specific I should get, but it starts out um, with uh, kind of like a quintal based sonority. The sonorities are based on fifths, and then morphs into a slightly more chromatic language, and then returns to a more uh, quintal and triadic harmonic language at the end. Don't let the technical terms scare you. It sounds beautiful. I'm so smart. <laughs> It's simple, so, and then it gets a little more complicated. It, it it's gets a little simple. more complicated than that, yeah. Uh, and there, you get some beautiful sounds in the orchestra, especially the shimmering percussion. So there's a lot of instruments out there that maybe we're not so familiar with. Do you, um, can you t say, talk a little bit about these instruments, and how, like, how did you find all of these great shimmering sounds? Oh my goodness, let's see. Um, well, one sound that uh, that I think is really kind of unnervingly, uh, delightfully unnervingly weird in this context. Um, is if you're in the balcony, if you're in an upper row, you might notice it. Uh, the timpanist puts a suspended cymbal on the timpani, um, on one of the drums, and he turns it upside down, and by rolling on the cymbal and manipulating the pedal, you get this great kind of <laughs> That was not a great and, and it, it, it's, it's in a texture. So, yeah, it's, so It's part of a texture, so kind of things just sort of oscillate and um, you can hear the harmonics changing uh, um, and it's uh, a striking timbre that um, that you might not uh, that you might not recognize elsewhere um, and then there's a lot of I don't know there's the glockenspiel there's triangles there crotales um, bowed vibraphone there's beltry um, there's uh, there's celeste there's harp it's, a, it's like taking out the whole garage. Right. And, and Everything's yeah. shiny. Is this shiny? <laughs> <laughs> it's in. Yes. Cool. And, and Chris, um, also, 
your piece, well, actually, maybe you should tell us a little bit kind of more about this arc of what happens in these seven movements. And it has, there are a lot of titles. There and are. do you think about the titles as part of the composition or do they come afterwards? Uh, let's talk about the process a little bit in sure, through yeah. this piece. Sure, <laughs> yeah. It's a slightly uh, overload of titles in this piece. Um, the titles are very diaristic in that they were sort of little things I jotted down as I was writing the piece. The little quotations, they're from all sorts of places. Um, and the playwright named Minda Walsh, a uh, uh, poet named Mei Mei Bersenburga, a Chinese American poet. Um, Teju Cole, Nigerian American writer. And it's just like they're like the little images that I, you feel free to ignore them, but if you want to know what image I had floating in my mind, you know, the, the first, um, there was a beautiful uh, play that I saw in the play. At one point, the character looks over and says, How many other things had wings that I didn't know have wings? Um, which was such a beautiful line to me. And I thought of Jenny floating above with wings and, you know, sort of the first image and one of many. But the title, Breaks and Breaks, uh, comes from a Stanley Kunitz poem called The Testing Tree. And it's, uh, in a murderous time, the heart breaks and breaks and lives by breaking, um, which I think is just such a beautiful image. Um, and it sort of like offers both a bleak and incredibly optimistic vision. And I think that I tried to present on sort of each of this. And um, I also like the title Breaks and Breaks because like the piece itself, it's a palindromic title, meaning breaks and breaks, same forwards and backwards. Um, and the piece itself is kind of a palindrome. It's in seven short movements that are connected but so one, three, five, and seven all kind of use the same material, two and six, and then there's one big central movement which is kind of at the heart of the piece. And I was hearing the piece yesterday actually and I was thinking a lot about the idea that the piece kind of breaks in half right in the middle of the piece. And the rest of the piece is almost like trying to remember everything that's happening. But when you remember it, it always comes out a little different, just like real memory. Yeah, and, and now what about the usage of the orchestra and the difficulties of writing a concerto and right. writing a part that both, both is part of the orchestra, yet it's also a concerto, and they share a lot of material. Oh yeah, and well, the, you know, so it's funny, you grew up, you know, I, I grew up listening to more recordings of classical music than attending concerts, and the funny thing about you listen to a violin concerto on a recording, and it's like, violin, way in the front, and then, you know, like the orchestra somewhere in the back. And when you write a real violin concerto, you realize a violin is very small, despite the um, <laughs> wonderful tone that Jenny possesses. And, you know, when I was writing it, she kept saying, like, Chris, don't, don't over-orchestrate. It's really easy to cover the violin. Um, and I kept trying, and even, so even when we started rehearsing, and we had to be so careful about sort of pulling everyone back to give them the space. But, you know, I was thinking, you know, as I was writing the piece, you know, we kind of called it almost like a concerto grosso in that Jenny sort of floats in and out of the texture. Sometimes she's trading off notes, you know, passing off 16th notes with the orchestra very quickly, and sometimes she's playing kind of full lyrical melodies. But I always thought of her as the generator of all the materials in the work. So she plays something, and then it comes, you know, sort of the opening, she plays this melody, and then it starts being echoed by different members of the orchestra. And then the second movement, she's playing 16th notes, and then the orchestra's all imitating her. So I thought of Jenny as the generative engine of all the music in the piece. So everything she plays gets echoed in the orchestra, and that's sort of how I thought of her, both as a soloist, but also sort of the leader of the orchestra. And, you know, some, sometimes when a soloist plays, it's very obvious that it's difficult. Um, sometimes it might sound difficult, and it's actually not difficult. In this scenario, it is a very difficult piece for her, but you might not realize it, um, because there are, she basically could have a motor in her right arm <laughs> to play so many fast notes that he's written. Uh, so is this kind of, this motor thing is a big part of this piece, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought of one thing of way, I like, I always love the idea of a kind of virtuosity of energy. So that one way that I, I can say, you know, I'm not interested in, you know, Jenny can do anything. And it's almost like she can do so much, it's almost like no, it's not interesting. What is interesting to me is how is a musician, how is she a musician and how is she musical? So, you know, one she, thing she asked me, she's like, can I have some long lines? So, you know, she's a composer, always give me a million notes. So I gave her some very long lines and she really has room to interpret that. And the other thing I loved was the sort of energy and thinking about virtuosity as energy, virtuosity as an engine of movement. And that's a big part of this piece as well. So yeah, a lot of it is just like her having to like ice her arm after the performance because she's played so many notes. And, and of course, 
Did either of you know that the Tchaikovsky 6 would be on the second half? Did, when I don't think I did. Okay, because, sim, you know, similarly, I mentioned this in the first rehearsal. Actually, his, sixth, say that. <laughs> his sixth movement ends with a bang, and then the seventh is like a coda. So that is a little bit of a preview of that third and fourth movement relationship in Tchaikovsky. It's true. I also used to be obsessed with the second movement of the, of the Tchaikovsky oh. symphony, because it was the first piece of classical music I ever heard in 5-4 time. Right, so, so the second movement of, that he's talking in the, in the Pathétique is, well, okay, well, Tchaikovsky really knew how to write a waltz, right? And this is a waltz, except it's not in three, which is um cha cha um cha. This is in five. Da da dee 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 da dee. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. How do you dance to that? <laughs> okay, we have uh, a couple minutes left. I, I usually reserve just a few minutes, but with, with two composers, maybe we have more questions than normal. So if I open up the floor to the audience to ask questions of these wonderful, uh, talented people about their music, about uh, the process, about what, whatever, please uh, feel free. Yes, right here. Okay, so the question is a very important process question, which is kind of from the day that you find out about the piece or get the commission until the day that you can hand in maybe the final version. How about how long does that take, or in this case, how long did it take? Long story short, for me, for this piece, I want to say 14 months. And, and that, that's 14 months of writing or a lot of thinking and about there two nights of writing? And rumination. <laughs> rumination is an important part of the compositional process. Um, there was, uh, it was probably, I want to say actual writing, uh, I want to say six, seven months. For, for about seven and a half minutes, right? That's, yeah. 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 Takes a lot. And, and Chris? Um, I think the first conversations about this piece were had uh, a little over two years ago. And uh, when I was actually last here in Detroit and I got to see the symphony for the first time and then sort of quite a while and then I sort of I was thinking a lot about it over the fall and so much thinking <laughs> and I started I actually started writing in earnest and it was actually written quite quickly for me. Um, I started at sort of the middle of December and I mailed it in sort of the middle of April, but it was a very, very concentrated period of work where I only worked on this. Let, let me ask a quick follow up question. Do you, we use computers now, so does that speed up the process of putting things in? I think so, yeah. I mean, it I'm speeds here. up the literal process of getting notes on the page. I don't think it speeds up the composing process. Right. Uh, so you're both American composers, but you have an ethnicity, and I'm wondering how that informs these decisions or not. Yeah, so uh, both of you were born in the States and are um, American, but we have a Hungarian last name, right? No, actually, no, no it, I get it's Hungarian not a lot. It is not Hungarian. I usually make people guess, but we're pressed for time. My dad is from Iran. It's a Persian oh, name. Persian name. And, and so the question, and, and then the Italian name, but L Long Island. Long you know? Island. Um, my dad was born in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> so so does, does that background influence or in, in your kind of feeling about the music, or do you try to ever put some of that in? You know, I have had pieces where I, um, I have tried to put in... So my father is Persian, my mother is American, um, and so when you're first generation, um, it's a funny thing to be a first generation American. So I think uh, my daughter, who is seven, is very interested in her grandfather's culture, but as a first generation, I mean, I was a bratty first generation kid, so I kind of did a lot of that. So a as an adult, I feel like it's disingenuous for me to go back and literally try to uh, retroactively cop some details, but I think um, you know certainly it affected the way I grew up and the way I the things I listened to growing up, and it certainly affected me kind of in a grand scheme of things, but not in a literal, literal specific way. Any Italian here? I mean, uh, you're, you're, I was just saying, you know, he, he spent a year in Italy, so I then he became Cerrone. Cerrone. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say that somewhere betwixt the strip malls of Long Island and the, uh, the sunny peninsula of Italy is where my aesthetic lies. Um, because I do think there's something about having grown up in this place, which I kind of regard, no offense to Long Islanders out there, as a bit of a cultural wasteland. Um, and, I, you know, and so the idea of being a classical composer was like the most romantic thing I could possibly think of. It was the least Long Island thing. But then I'm from this place where classical music kind of comes from. So um, I did live in Italy for a year. Opera was playing in my house when I was growing up. And I wound up writing at least two operas. So 
to deny the influence seems uh, spurious. You know, it's, it's there. And I think that if there is a lyrical impulse on my music, I think it's probably, Italian composers always seem to have some kind of lyrical impulse, even the most complicated ones. Okay, one quick question. Yeah, so the question is whether Chris is a part of the group Sleeping Giants. I am. Uh, guilty. Uh, it's a compo collective of I got the eye on the clock. A collective of six composers. We also all went to Yale together, um, and we're sort of spread out over the states now. But we did a uh, um, a six composer project evening long work for a chamber group called Eighth Blackbird, and it was premiered uh, what 20 miles north of here in Bloomfield Hills at the Great Lakes Festival, and they commissioned that. So um, yeah, that was the, the, my first of many experiences in Detroit. Um, it was a, a, a work in a owned by the family who commissioned it called Swarm. It's a group called Random International, a collective of artists based in London. And it was a light reactive sculpture. So if you clapped, it would react with all these glittering lights. And so I wrote a piece of glittering, glittering brightness. So sort of a response. OK, so we have to vacate the stage. Um, but you're in for a real treat. Both of these pieces are phenomenal and uh, fun to listen to. You can hear two very distinct voices. And then, of course, after the pause is a wonderful, wonderful masterwork in classical history. So thank you so much for being here. We hope you enjoy the concert. Thank you.